All right, here we go. In three, two, one. All right, welcome back to the NFL Depth Chart sh Show from our lad Scouting Services. It is the first time in history of the Depth Chart Show that it is just Tucker and myself. We are going to rip through these episodes every single week on Thursday afternoons. They'll be live for you guys to watch sometimes. If not, you probably can expect them on Thursday nights, prepping you for the next week. And before we get into this week's episode, we want to kind of preview what we're going to be doing over these next 18 weeks, what you can expect from us. And what we're going to do is we're truly going to lean into what our lads is known for, and that is the depth charts. I've talked to people in the league. I've talked to people in the media. I've talked to friends and family. For over a decade, this is the go-to source for NFL depth chart information. And while we can sit here and analyze and evaluate town, and that is what we're known for on the NFL draft side, this, this show and this series is going to be less about opinion and predictions and projections and more about what is actually happening in the NFL. And this, all of this information that you see the media talk about, it all stems from the depth chart. And I hear podcasts like Robert Mays from The Athletic. I hear Daniel Jeremiah from NFL Network. They're constantly referencing our lads for the depth charts. Everyone needs to have a strong grasp of what's going around on in the league. And it all stems from the depth charts. And Tucker is our main man for those depth charts. This guy is the what Ryan used to call the Duke of the depth charts. But Tucker... Do you sleep? That's my first question for you, because this is a 24-7, 365 operation. Not not nearly enough, I don't think, but uh, I'm glad we're carrying on the Duke of Death Charts. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that, that one had to stay. That's in memory That's in, uh, in memory of Ryan McKee there. Um, but hey, I mean, I'll, I want to dive into this first week's episode and really kind of dive into the meat of what this Death Chart show is going to be all about. And we're going to start off with discussing the 53-man roster cut down who were the biggest surprise cuts this can get pretty subjective but we have a list of guys that i want to talk about what happened maybe why it happened and where these guys ended up and i'm going to start off with two nfl draft picks from this last spring that i scouted um i scout primarily on the offensive side of the ball for our leads and uh we're going to get the uh the pack uh so we'll, we don't need to get these depth charts up yet we'll just start off talking about michael pratt the quarterback from the Green Bay Packers, who was a seventh rounder, a surprise to see him go that far down in the draft because um, we, a lot of us, myself, Jim Nagy, our staff at our lads, we had a fourth slash fifth round grade on him. Day three, yes, but not the end of the draft. It was a very weird draft. We saw a record amount of selections between Bo Nix and Spencer Rattler, um, and there were no other quarterbacks taken between that first and fifth round slot. And so Pratt was part of that victim of just kind of getting pushed down the pile a little bit. But at no point did I ever think that he would have actually been uh, cut from the Packers roster. And who did they replace him with? Do you remember that move? Oh, with so they they ended up they they brought back Clifford on the practice squad. Okay, it was, it was their fifth round pick last year, and then they yeah. traded for Malik Willis. Was like the because they didn't, they weren't really happy with either Clifford or Pratt, from what I could tell. I mean, the preseason games they didn't look great. Like Pratt, I know Pratt they liked to practice a lot, but then kind of in recent weeks with the preseason, he struggled a lot more, and they just weren't really happy with either. So I was surprised though that they they kept Clifford and not Pratt. I figured it might be the opposite, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, Malik Willis is their now now their their number two guy. And what's interesting here is Pratt got put onto the Tampa Bay practice squad. So that means he's there for the pickings for any, everyone in the NFL. And no one's bringing him onto the active roster. Now we are in the era where most teams like to carry two quarterbacks. And with Green Bay, they're very economic with their roster usage and what they do on others on, on at the other positions. But he is there for the taking. And Green Bay has not taken him back onto the active roster. And neither have the other 31 teams. Uh, in the NFL. The second one that I was equally surprised with, this is football nerd mode. It was another draft pick that I scouted from USC, an offensive lineman. His name was Jarrett Kingston. He was a sixth round pick. It's very rare to see someone use a sixth round pick on a player and they don't end up on that roster. And I bet their plan 
uh, San Francisco was to stash him on their practice squad because he does offer a lot of inside out versatility. He did play tackle in college. He definitely projected to the inside because of his size and, and length shortcomings. But this is a guy that went from San Francisco uh, to Carolina and Carolina signed them to the active 53. Um, let's see if we got that, that, that roster up. Is that dude, that's an interesting piece yeah. to talk about. Yep. So here's the offensive line from Carolina. This roster is scary bad. We might be talking about another side of the ball in a little bit, but if you can see that offensive line, and this is where the depth charts are really just quick to see what's happening is it's color coded. Those orange guys are all rookies and you see two guys on the interior of the offensive line, Kingston being one of them. That W right there stands for they were picked up off of waivers. And what happens, Tucker, explain what happens when someone picks, uh, clicks on a player there, just kind of give a little bit more background information. On their player page? On Kingston, yep. Yeah. So here we don't – this wasn't the guy we had a report on in the book. But, yep. um, yeah, sometimes there will be a – there'll be a, usually a scouting report down here. Um, but otherwise it just gives some, some, you know, vital information here and there's their, their uh, height and weight and then their player history. So transaction history. So yeah, he was a six round pick as you can see over here. And then uh, he was picked up by, by Carolina at uh, the end of August there. Once, once the roster cutdowns happened, they made a ton of waiver claims at the end. Yeah, of the, they did. I mean, they made like, I think like six, uh, some of them are like old guys from Tampa that Canales knows like, um, like Isaac from, from Tampa uh yeah. shamar Bar bartholomew i knew i had a ton of claims but the panthers were first uh yeah. in, in line so they were able to get him yeah they now, were really would, would, would you you track the depth charts as as much as anyone that works for the league any, any depth chart manager in, in the nfl did you see these guys looking on a team that tried to rebuild their offensive line this offseason with the signings of damian lewis and robert hunt i mean they're an injury or two away from putting in undrafted free agent and a six round waiver claim from San Francisco onto the field. Was this something that you think they fell short on a little bit when it came to building up that offensive line in the depth? Yeah, I feel like, I mean, when you're, when you're doing that, I feel like you kind of want to have some more security. Like I, I didn't even know if Chandler Zavala would make the roster. Yeah. Um, Struggled they must, last year. They must like what, what they've seen from, from Kingston so far, but yeah, it's like, it's not really what you want to see for the interior is to have like, I mean, Brady Christensen can play wherever. They kind of tried him every spot in the line. But it, it's looking like they're just going to be rolling with Andrew Rame as, like, the backup center guy um, and, and Jarek Kingston. It's, it's just pretty, you know, it's already they're kind of overspending a bit on the guard, the, the increased guard market that's going on. Um, and the depth is not that great. So it's I think they're really just going kind of long term here, not really trying to make, the, you know, not trying to win the Super Bowl this year or anything. Cool. Now let's move on to a couple of these veterans roster cuts that I was surprised by when I saw, I looked at the full list of, of roster cuts once they became available and I circled names that I just, a did not see coming. Hey, I'm interested in this guy for other teams. He's going to get signed. And, and one of them was Neville Gallimore. Let's go to the dolphins depth chart here because I want to kind of talk my way through why I believe this might have been a mistake by the Dolphins, and, and only time will tell. But this is a team that lost Christian Wilkins and Raekwon Davis to free agency this last year. They combined for 1,400 snaps last year. And Wilkins is, is widely considered one of the best defensive tackles in the game. Davis is more of a run stuffer. Neville Gallimore has not lived up to the height in Dallas, but this is a 26-year-old that in this preseason had a 10% plus pressure rate and that's not a common number that you see from defensive tackles. And he's a multi-situation player. He's not just a pass rusher. He has not been a total wash in the NFL. And I was really surprised to see them to see them get rid of. And he quickly got scooped up mm -hmm. by the Los Angeles Rams as they try to construct the defensive line post Aaron Donald. Was that a move that you saw? And, and did you think that was something that you know? I mean, they they probably took Brandon Peely over him because he's a nose tackle run stuffer, but. You know, keeping Deshaun Hand there over Neville Gallimore, or he just not getting rid of Neville Gallimore was was a rough move for them. Yeah, I was pretty surprised. I thought that they might go a little deeper on on the, the D line there um, because of how shaky it is behind Zach Siler. I mean, I like Calais Campbell a lot, but you know, he's he's getting pretty old. Um, he's still still solid for last year. I mean, he still was a starter, so played a good number of snaps for Atlanta. Um, but 
yeah, it's like they, this is looking at the history really quick. So, I mean, we had him as like a second string. He, he would have been the sixth guy, I, I bet, if they kept um, more. But, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of surprised because, you know, they got rid of Tart as well, um, who was someone that I know that you liked. Like, yeah. I feel like he was an underrated guy, kind of. Yep. But he's sort of bounced around the last couple months. Yep. Um, now he's had some success in the NFL. He might be more of a scheme dependent, and maybe that's part of this, right? Mm -hmm. uh, new defensive scheme in Miami this year. So that always plays a part. I know that's kind of where I try to cut off my evaluation of good mood, bad mood, because sometimes these guys just don't fit the scheme or fit the culture of a new uh, defensive coach. Let's stick with the Dolphins because one of the names I'm also surprised to see go was in the wide receiver room, and this was Eric Azukama. Um, th this is a kid that just came out of the draft just three years ago. And every time I would read up on Miami, Mike McDaniel and the GM, they love this kid. I mean, all they did was talk this kid up and, you know, he did get signed to the practice squad. So I don't want to say they kicked him to the curb, but as I said earlier, when you put someone on the practice squad, he is now available for the taking by everyone in the NFL at any given moment. You know, you don't you don't get a shot if someone comes in and says, hey, I want to uh, take this kid in um, has battled injury, uh, but he just fits that speed profile. And he brings something to the table that a lot of these receivers on in this receiver room, they don't bring. And it's size. I mean, this guy is 6'2", 205, and he knows how to use it. I mean, Braxton Berrios, Tyree Kill, Jalen Waddle, even the kid that I absolutely love, Malik Washington, he's great. Mm -hmm. They're all small. They're under six feet tall. I think they're under five foot eleven. So they did make a waiver claim for Grant DeWills, but Malik Washington is a guy that, you know, if anyone's watching this, it gets really into fantasy football sleepers, really deep leagues. That's a kid that I think you're going to hear his name at some point um, in this offense. Yeah, he's a super exciting. I mean, I'm happy that it was kind of uh, sketchier because they had um, they had a few more. They had someone else at uh, in the slot besides Barrios, and I guess what was what was going on was like if they had Odell stay on the roster like because he's on he's on the uh the pup right now yep. so they have they kind of had an extra spot but it, w it wasn't like a guarantee that he made it I figured that he would but it wasn't a guarantee Malik Washington would make it just right. because of like he's part, part of his part of his appeal is like the return game yep. and they have Barrios so there is some yep. redundancy there but I mean he offers a lot in terms of being a weapon as well so yeah. I like that they yeah. kept him one of my favorite values of drafts weekend. Absolutely. But, you know, to quote Daniel Jeremiah, you want your wide receiver room often to look like a basketball team. Like you got your big guys, you got your small guys, you got your, your hybrids that can play inside and outside. This to me is just the same exact profile uh, across the board between Washington, Barrios, Hill and Waddle, who I right now expect to be the top four primary pass catchers from that wide receiver room. And, but I'll tell you what, I, I think that Mike McDaniel has proven himself well enough to not question what he's doing. He has a plan for these guys and it, they favor speed as much as if not more than everyone in the NFL. So, and that's what all these guys have as did have the speed. And again, he didn't get kicked to the curb. He's just there for the taking um, in the NFL. But one last observation in regard to this situation, the influx in wide receiver talent since 2018, 2019. I mean, I feel like every year, draft analysts are saying, hey, this is one of the strongest receiver classes ever. I mean, I really do feel like I've heard that set the seven years in a row. And with the game changing in the high school and junior level with the amount of seven on seven and how developed these kids are coming into college and then they develop even further there, you know, it's this might be a sign of the times that you're going to see a lot of good wide receiver talent you know, put on practice squads because they're not that afraid of losing them because they're not that hard to find. Yeah, absolutely. And like, it just, it, it's more and more important to have to offer special teams value. And, and if you don't have that aspect, if you're just strictly an offensive player, you better be a, you know, you better be playing a good, a good deal, be a starter or, or, or something like have super high upside because they only have so many slots for guys that can keep on their 53 that are just kind of like red shirt type developmental guys, because, mm -hmm. you know, like, like you said, when you're on the practice squad, you can just be picked up by anybody. So right. um, when someone, I get surprised when someone gets cut because I'm like, oh, that means they don't, they don't maybe care as much. You know, they probably keep, kept someone else over him that they like their their prospects better. Sure, yeah. they still like Azukama, but I mean, it could, you know, there's there's always stuff like where 
he fits, you know, he might love this, love the team there, fits really well there, but you never know if a team watches, you know, his film and is like, we like the potential here for our scheme as well. Right. Yeah, I mean, that, that's another good reason, guys. When, when you're watch, looking through these depth charts, you really want to spend a lot of time on these pages and really try to get a grasp and a feel, especially early in the year. Because if you do think that, hey, I don't know where uh, Ezukama stacks up on this team. The fact, I mean, the team is telling you right now that right now they are way valued under uh, Malik Washington, a rookie that has not accomplished anything, or the Grant DuBose, the guy that they claimed um, from Green Bay. I mean, because as injuries pile up and you never know with a Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle with their soft tissue issues that they've had in the past, who is going to be the guy that comes up? And if you really do study these depth charts and spend time on them, you're going to have a leg up on information. And I think the best front offices in the NFL, they do exactly that. They, they're overkill on how much time they spend on the depth charts because they don't skip a beat. They know exactly what's going to happen before it happens. They know what players are going to become available if someone were to go down. So it's another reason if you guys are very into fantasy football to try to stay ahead of the curve by staying on top of these depth charts. Let's stick at wide receiver and we'll go to Houston. Uh, this was a name that surprised me that he was cut and it was Noah Brown from the Houston Texans. Not that this guy is going to change your offense, but I'll tell you what, he was one of the most important receivers down the stretch, especially in November for a team that barely made the playoffs. And now the fact that they, you know, they bring in Stefan Diggs, John Mechie seems like he's got um, some of his juice back, but it, I mean, this team took kept seven receivers and it's always interesting to see some teams will keep seven receivers. Some teams keep five. It's, it's really, there's no exact four, like a lion. Like... <laughs> Were you surprised about Noah Brown? I was, very, yeah, I was surprised. I mean, what, what, like I had heard the whole off season was like Robert Woods was the cut guy, you know, right. That's what I, exactly what I thought. Robert as well. Woods, keep Brown. And they still kept seven and opted to move on from Brown. So that I, I was very surprised, but I, I guess they love Robert Woods as like a leader in that, in that receiver room. Like yep. not just, just because they added dig doesn't mean that he's that Woods is, you know, redundant or anything. Yeah. And, you know, by the way, no Brown signed with Washington and they had that, that wide receiver spot that opened up with Jahan Dotson trade. Again, that's another reason why to keep track of these depth charts, you see a trade, you see a cut, you see a move, you see a, a move to IR, you can follow you can follow the crumbs and you can really see all right there's going to be a hole there on Washington um you know we're going to go out and sign a guy with NFC experience that's he started off in Dallas and um you know that that behind Terry McLaurin I think it's wide open you know it I is. put Luke McCaffrey on the R lads preseason all rookie team not because I think he's the best receiver I had a fourth round grade on him uh, it's because he's going to get the most amount of opportunities in an offense that wants to get the ball out quick with Cliff Kingsbury and a rookie quarterback in Jaden Daniels. Where do you see the fit with Noah Brown in Washington? Yeah, I mean, I think it made all the sense in the world just because of when they got rid of Dotson, it's like they it was clear they needed to do something to to kind of fill that that void. Not that Dotson was a was a game changer for them, but just having another kind of body in there. I mean, he he was playing a lot of first team team reps like throughout the off season he was he was like losing out somewhat to like Deami Brown and McCaffrey at points but he was still kind of he was basically like the number two next right. to Zacchaeus McCa and, and McLaurin um but yeah I think I mean that was a perfect fit to grab Noah Brown especially just because it's Dan Quinn grabbing another another like ex-cowboy um and uh yeah it's it's really wide open. I mean, I, I did just have Deami Brown ahead of McCaffrey like two days ago, but the, the team, I don't, you know, I don't put too much in like the team depth charts that they release, but right. it, it is, I find it notable when they do have like a rookie as a starter, especially That's like this was really weird to me. I was like, this is a case where you would definitely think that they would put Deami Brown ahead, but they, they had McCaffrey ahead. I don't know if that really matters. They'll both play a lot, but. I, I did something to kind of watch and see how the target share and snap count is in week one because it can it'll it'll evolve, but it's good to see the first week how the coaches are thinking. Good point. That's a great point. Yeah, I, let's stick with this this theme of how many rookies are. I, I love the, the how easy it is to see how many rookies a team is truly relying on in the starting lineup. And you know, you go to Washington, there's three starters on offense, and with with a new offensive scheme, that could be good, that could be bad, but you know, there's just going to be. 
uh, it's going to be a roller coaster for this team. And the offensive line is where I think they're going to struggle this year. It's going to hold them back just a tad. But, hey, they got the R-Lads number one quarterback in last year's draft. I think we were the only ones that had Daniels at QB1. I'm curious to see how he does there. But let's dive into the next portion of the show. And it's going to be just kind of studying the depth chart. We want to give you guys some information on which team is relying on rookies the most. And I did a little uh, – I, I keep track of this year to year, so this is easy for me to do. But our lads depth chart is – makes it much easier to kind of confirm information. The What is your guess, or do you know, Duke of Dev Charts, which team has the most rookies on their opening 53-man roster? Uh, I have the answer, would, so. What was that? I have the answer, so if you get it wrong, I'll tell you what page to go to. It, it's, well, it's probably either it's probably either the Panthers or, the, or Washington. I, I would I'm about to surprise you, Tucker. It's the Rams. Go the to the Rams, Rams page oh, and just take a visual of what this looks like right here with the Reds, the Commander. Sorry. Oh yeah, their defense. It's crazy. Look how many. <laughs> it's it's. This reminds me. The Green Bay Packers had a roster like this last year, and they ended up yeah. doing great. They they got off to a rough start, but they ended up doing great. The Rams have sixteen rookies on this roster, and look how much of their defenders. I mean, almost I think over a third, forty percent of their defenders are rookies, and. They also lost their all pro hall of famer, Aaron Donald this year. I mean, this is what I love about the Rams front office is they have a plan. They stick to it and they don't care if it's a bunch of undrafted rookies. Not only Tucker is do the Rams lead the NFL in rookies on the opening 53 man roster, but they also lead the NFL with the amount of undrafted free agent rookies on the roster. And it's six. And I believe all of those guys, minus Cody Schrader, the waiver claim from San Francisco and the running back uh, in the backfield, are on the defensive side of the ball. And yeah, I mean, it seems that way. Yeah. In all your years, I, I tried to go back and look some of my old information. Do you remember? I mean, you're, you're on top of these depth charts year after year. Do you remember anything like this? The only thing it reminds me of is the Rams last year. <laughs> <laughs> and they ended up being a pretty good team. They found Puka yeah. Nakua. I got a buddy that's a Rams fan. So I was like, are we really sure about Puka Nakua? Because if he, if that guy is not real, this, this could get really ugly really quick. And it's not just because the Matthew Stafford is aging or Cooper Cup can't stay healthy. That that defense scares me a little bit. you know. And this is the team where Neville Gallimore went to. And obviously that – Again, that's a, a miss, I think, by Miami. We'll see in time. But they are truly depending on a lot of inexperience um, if, if injuries pop up. And in today's NFL, I mean, it's inevitable that you're going to hit some injury snags. Yeah, and you already mentioned losing Aaron Donald. They also, of course, lost Raheem Morris to Atlanta, which is, which is I think, a big a big thing. The player, obviously, is one of the most like, loved coaches in the league. Yep, yep. Um, and – as well as you know, other other members of their staff like Zach Robinson, um, but not yet, not only that, just just recently they traded like their their best their best inside linebacker Ernest Jones to the Titans, Good which point. was pretty surprising, like to a lot of Rams fans when I saw it, um, and that's partly because of how well Omar Spates has done in the off season. Like th he's been like a star. So they felt comfortable with that just because of, of spades, I think. And then yeah. having, having a, they, they like Rose boom as well, but you know, it, it also just kind of goes, I don't think that they value the linebacker position that much yeah. as a team. It's, it's definitely like their least, they find that the least important in terms of allocating cap space. Yeah. I mean, look what they did in the draft. I mean, they trade, they draft uh, Jared verse and then they make it a very aggressive trade up for Braden Fisk. And this is a year after Kobe Turner, led the NFL rookies in sacks and Byron Young had a great year. I mean, this team really does invest in, in, in the front via the draft. I mean, look at that defensive line, you know, with, with Tucker's information, you have 2024 second rounder, a 2021 fourth rounder, a 2023 third rounder, 2023 third rounder. And then you got the first rounder, Jared verse. And, you know, it, it just goes to show that's another reason why I love looking at these depth charts. You can really easily see, which team has invested a lot of draft capital into a very specific area. And then that can kind of feed into, all right, what does, what is the philosophy of this front office? And for these guys on the defensive side of the ball, it's, we're not afraid of youth and we're going to invest a lot of resources in the defensive front. And we feel no hesitation in trading away a linebacker that was probably going to have to get paid next year. And this team does not have a ton of cash to throw around. 
very an interesting situation to monitor there. But yeah, just I'll just kind of rip through the the rest of the top five uh, rookies and undrafted free agents. The Las Vegas Raiders finished with twelve. Buffalo has eleven. New England has ten. Seattle has ten. That's the rookies on the t- uh, amount of rookies on the team, and the amount of undrafted rookies on a team. Rams lead the league with six. Carolina has four. The Jets have four, uh, three of which are on the defensive line. Yep. Uh, the Raiders have four. And the Chiefs, who are playing in just a few hours, have three. So we are going to dive into that Chiefs-Raiders game. But one thing you put on our outline that I think is really interesting to talk about as we start to, as a scouting company, and we're very looking into the NFL draft, is who's going to have that number one pick. Let's go to the Panthers real quick before we dive into – uh, the two games that are coming up these next two days. Let give give us an information on what is going on in that that defensive line room specifically at the edge position. Yeah, so like I mean, earlier in the off season, I, I actually kind of liked how they addressed it. Um, they really overhauled like their whole defense with the, with the new coaching staff and Dave Canales, um, and they got Clowney was to be their their top edge rusher, who's still slotted in there, obviously. Uh, and they, they grabbed DJ Wonham from from uh, Minnesota, but he's had injury issues all all off season, and so he he's starting the season on the pup list, as well as uh, Amari Barno, who who they who played played a decent amount last year as like a late round pick. Um, so that kind of just leaves them though now with with it just it was just with Clowney, and then they had uh, Caleb on Chase on from Jacksonville who certainly did not do great there. And I know Jaguars fans do not, do not think he's he's a great player, but he did play a good amount, um, which I usually look at the experience that they have. Coaches will usually defer to that over, you know, just raw and proven guys, but they cut him a few days ago. And I found that pretty surprising just because of who who's behind Clowney. If, if, if like Wonham or Barno were still healthy, I would get it, but it's like, Behind them, they have DJ Johnson, who's a third-round pick from last year, who who didn't play very much. Um, Iku Leota, who, who I think he played a little bit more than Johnson did. He was an yep. undrafted guy last year. And then Jamie Sheriff, they claimed off waivers from Seattle, who's an undrafted guy out of uh, out of South Alabama. So I was pretty surprised with. I don't I don't know if they're going to make a move or, but they seem to be pretty confident in just rolling with their young guys and trying to develop this team. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely going to be a patient slow burn with a new coaching staff. Uh, but one thing this organization has proven is that the owner is David Tepper is very sh- short tempered. Yes. But also not very patient with his NFL mm-hmm. health coaches. He's had multiple guys already in a short tenure and um, you know, but the, the defense, this kid sheriff, he, he is worth keeping an eye on. This is, he did was number two in the NFL this preseason with t- 12 pressures and he tied for second in the NFL and three sacks. Now I'm not going to overreact to that. It was against backups and third stringers and guys that aren't even on rosters right now, but he did produce. And that that's a move that is worth looking at. But I mean, this is bottom of the barrel pass rush. I mean, Tucker, this team finished dead last last year in pressure rate and sacks. I don't only look at pressures. I look at pressure rate more so because it's based on how many times a team is actually rushing the passer and they were dead last there and sacks last year. And even worse, beyond Derek Brown, the defensive tackle stud out of Auburn, loved him in 2020, and he's turning into a really good player. I think they already locked him in long term. But after him, the next six guys in total pressures, they're all gone. I mean, Brian Burr, and I know they brought in Clowney, but I question Clowney a little bit because I think the scheme in Baltimore really helped him out. The situation in Baltimore helped him out, and that's why he had that career year. So if he kind of regresses to the mean clowny I'm talking about, there's nothing on this roster that's going to scare an opposing passing attack because you could just double team Derek Brown all day, and I don't think any of these guys are going to be really tri- uh, be able to to beat one on blo- one blocking. DJ Johnson is a big, fast, athletic, strong kid, but we didn't see enough out of him uh, in year one. But yeah, if you guys want to go, who is DJ Johnson? All right, a lot of you guys might not know. That scouting report right there is exactly what we put in that draft guide last year. So it's uh, look, we had a sixth or seventh round grade on him, and he went in round three. So there, mm-hmm. there's something there with him that they see, but we haven't seen it yet on the NFL level. Yeah, I know, I know that he's he's someone they've liked a lot during this off season, but you never, you know, you never really know until that actually in game yeah. in game uh, 
games are going on. Yeah, so. the predominant articles if coming from reporters and coaches are, hey, we love this guy. We love this guy. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the, the percentage of the times where that actually hits is, is pretty low. Let's dive into the two games uh, tonight and tomorrow night. We don't have to go too into depth because, again, we're not really truly analyzing who we think is going to win. But I mm-hmm. do think with our knowledge of the depth charts, we can start off with the Ravens uh, because I think they're the more interesting team to talk about. We know yeah. who the Chiefs are. Mm-hmm. The Ravens, they're playing with some fire in, in this game. Where do you see the biggest change and the most notable change in the depth chart that we should be watching Hey, and man, we made it four and a half hours. Let's go. <laughs> um, yeah. So well, before we get to the depth chart, I will say they lost a lot of like coach coaches. Um, yep. That's like, like Anthony Weaver to the Dolphins, yep. like, Michael Three Dan, like McDonald to Seattle. So that's, I think that's huge for the defense. They did retain a lot of their defense besides Patrick Queen, um, besides Geno Stone, but largely their defense is intact. I mean, they lost Clowney as well, but again, it's like it, he was sort of brought in because of a lot of injuries ahead of the position. So yeah. they don't really have a top end guy there. So they really want their young guys like Owe and, and uh, Tavius Robinson, David Ojabo, and then Adisa Isaac, but he's going to be out for this game at least. Um, they really need them to kind of step up. Uh, but otherwise, I mean, they love their secondary, love their defensive line, like the depth they have is just absurd. Mm. Um, and then the other thing that we've talked about is their, their offensive line is yeah. the really suspect part of their team that like is pretty important, especially since they got Derrick Henry um, and have a guy like Lamar Jackson. I mean, they have an all new left guard, right guard and uh, right tackle. Although Patrick McCarry has been there for forever. Um, he's usually he's, they love to have him as a sixth guy yep. so he can play anywhere and fill in. Truly um, everywhere. I mean, the guy yeah. can play center, he can play left tackle. It's amazing. Yeah, I think I list him. I don't know if I changed it. I changed the tackle, but I, I usually list him as just an O-lineman because he plays every spot. Um, I did have Roger Rosengarten there, but it's sounding like in recent days that they are going to put Macari in for the first game. Mm. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they ended up switching in this game or, or later, you know, just to see what they got in him. Um, but Daniel Falele, they moved from right tackle last year, and he wasn't – He wasn't. Uh, I don't think he started um, – and Andrew Voorhees was a seventh round pick from last year who uh, I think he like tore his ACL or Achilles before the ACL, draft. Yeah. Yep. yeah. So he went really late and they knew that he was going to miss his first year because of that, but yeah. they like him a lot, but again, he has no NFL experience yet. So it's, yeah. uh, and Ronnie Stanley isn't who he used to be. Um, and uh, like Tyler Linderbaum is really the only proven kind of uh, top end guy that they have. Yeah. Yeah, I want to throw in some thoughts on these on these guards. I think the guards are going to dictate a lot about how this offense is going to operate in an offense that now has Derrick Henry in the backfield. And Derrick Henry, he always commands the defense to load the load up the box. And that is where Lamar Jackson has the most success as a passer is when the box is full. So that that's where I think that part of why that move happened. I don't think we're going to see Derrick Henry get 20, 30 carries a game like he did in Tennessee, but I think his mere presence can manipulate the defense enough to get Lamar to his highest level. But that is only going to work if these guards do their job. I and mean, this team, I mean, what number do I have here? The team is 52 and 18 when Lamar starts. 52 and 18. They're 4 and 9 when he does not start over his career. And that, to me, one thing this offense on, you got to keep him upright. You don't want him scrambling around. The more he scrambles, the more he's running, the more he's relying on his legs, the more likely he's going to get hurt. And that this team falls apart when Lamar is hurt. Fiala, uh, sorry, I'm going to give a little uh, Voorhees report from my report on him a couple years ago. And like Tucker said, he tore his ACL at the scouting combine during a drill. But one of, one of his most famous stories here is that he still participated in the bench press at the combine he's short arms so those guys they love to bench press it can convince some people you're stronger than you really are because the range of motion is less but he he put up something like 38 39 reps but here's just like my opening paragraph um six year senior started all six seasons but played in just two games in 2019 because of an injured ankle he's a two-time first team all pack 12 and two-time all-american including first team honors in 2022 Voorhees is as experienced as it gets. He's played over 3,000 career snaps, mostly split between both guard spots and has seen some action at right and left tackle as well. He is technically sound with a smooth lower body bend and fluidity. He can be trusted 
to play with proper mental decisions and physical form. There is a strict ceiling to his potential, however, as he does not play with enough sudden reaction or sheer power. He struggles to recover, and he does not create enough power to get a big push off the ball. He should be drafted by a zone-heavy scheme, and he will be good enough in pass protection to start off his early career, to start early in his career. So I said this guy is going to start early in his career. Here we are in year two. He's now the starter for one of the best teams in the AFC. I do think there's a ceiling here that he's – He's not going to be a stud. He's not going to be a star, but that's not what you need in this offense. This team, this team was relying on Ben Powers and Kevin Zeitler, and the offense operated just fine. And I think all of that experience that he had in college, over 3,000 career snaps, that's a big deal. That that helps. This isn't a guy that's still new to the position, like Amarius Mims, for example. He played, I think, 300 snaps in college. Now he might be a starting right tackle for the Bengals. This guy has played a ton of football. You know what you're going to get out of him. But some of these issues to his game, that's going to be one thing I look for tonight because I don't think he has the spot locked in. I'm going to be watching this depth chart weekly, uh, Tucker. If you see a change or feel a change coming, Ben Cleveland, who's the backup mm -hmm. right guard on the depth chart, he has experience as a starter. He has played some football here, so he can easily insert into that spot. Uh, Fiale, Fale, uh, Fa, uh, man, this is a tough one to say. Fale, I don't um, know how to, I don't know either. So. <laughs> yeah, I'll just say the big guy because he is going to be the biggest player on the football field. If you remember, as a freshman at Minnesota, he weighed in at 400 pounds. I mean, this guy had to I lose know. a lot of weight to get to 360. We have him lifted at 380. 380. Look at that. He's got to be one of the biggest players in the NFL, maybe That's, the biggest. Yeah. So if you, if you don't, you know, number 77, we'll call him 77, all right? This guy has played 2,066 snaps in college. He played 363 snaps in the NFL regular season so far. One of those snaps have been at right guard. Yeah. Um, this was a guy that I did not like that much coming out of college. And Baltimore has done this in the past. They've drafted these big, enormous, heavy-footed, heavy-handed, long guys that are so big they can actually hide the issues with the athleticism. And that's what he does – at a pretty good level, but this is, I think this is the bigger question mark I personally have with how well, because he just doesn't, he's not an experienced guard. And with how quick NFL defenses are inside now at defensive tackle, that's where I think he can get into a lot of trouble. So that's going to be a guy I focus on tonight. For sure. And just like this last thing on the line, I mean, given the versatility of Patrick McCarry, like if one of the guys really struggles, they could easily just move him over, but then they have to put in, you know, a rookie at right tackle, Roger Rosengarden, or they could put in Ben Cleveland at one of the spots. I know he's been competing a lot to, yeah. to play it at left and right guard. Um, so it's really, it, it could easily be one of those situations, especially if they have like an injury similar to like the jets last year, where it's just kind of a rotation of, I, I changed the jets offensive line depth chart every week it was like yeah. <laughs> this guy's a guard this guy's a tackle now with this guy's a center it's like absurd so i'm, I'm hoping that they're able to kind of keep it together um not change too fast i think it would be good to you kind of need to have some cohesion between the guys up front yeah all right so we'll, we'll talk about one thing with the chiefs and then we'll move on to tomorrow night's game but the Kansas City Chiefs, you know a team that is truly be trying to become the next dynasty in the NFL and there's a lot to watch with this team. This team relies on rookies as much as any team in the NFL if they need to, right? Right now, it looks like they won't, but they have two rookies that are very, at very important spots of this offense, especially, as you guys can see, we see Hollywood Brown in red. What does that mean, Tucker? Yeah, if they're red, that means they're probably not going to play. In this case, he is, he is ruled out for this game. Okay, so even though we're not going to remove him from the death chart, but this is why, like, you know, visually yourself, you would say, all right, Justin Watson, he's Hollywood Brown's backup technically, according to this. That can change a little bit. Mm -hmm. And that is what we saw last year when they ran into wide receiver issues. Watson was the guy that got a lot of looks. So I think we're actually going to see a lot of him tonight. But I want to talk more about these rookies. Xavier Worthy and the left tackle, Kingsley Suomatia, a second, uh, a second rounder, is tasked with – protecting the blind side of Patrick Mahomes mm -hmm. and Andy Reid has had a lot of success with young linemen in recent years. Um, guys that are high picks, guys that are not high picks. They know what to do. They know how to scheme around it. But this was a guy that I loved. I had a first round grade on this kid all day. And I love that he ended up here because he's, he, he had, he ended up on my R last preseason, all rookie team because I think he's NFL ready right now. Yeah, I know he was, 
he was like from day one of beasts for them. Like it, I, I think he, I wouldn't say he won the job right instantly when he showed up, but he, he's just impressed every day that he's been there. I haven't heard like anything negative really, but it, it was surprising to chiefs beat writers wet that Wanya Morris uh, was not going to be the, the guy, but it, it was apparent once we saw uh, him playing preseason, they quickly got him out of there. Like they only let him play for a little bit and then put him away with the rest of the other starters like Mahomes. Right. So that's something really good to see. Yeah. And this team is also replacing uh, their number one corner in LeJarius Sneed. And they have invested a lot in the, in the defensive backfield in recent drafts. I mean, this team has been relying on first and second year corners, not necessarily even drafted in the first round as much as any winning team in football. I mean, it's amazing how much contribution they've gotten out of Jalen Watts in a seventh rounder, Chamari Connor, a fourth rounder, uh, even safety, uh, safety, Brian Cook, a second round, Joshua Williams, a fourth round. They're all in the, re- the past two drafts. But where do you see this defensive back room, specifically at corner? Uh, because I did, I like Snead a little bit more than McDuffie. Not everyone agrees on that. But where, do, in terms of outside corners, where do you th- see the replacement from Snead going between uh, the names that you have up there? Yeah, so McDuffie we used to have listed at, at nickel because – that's usually he would play both spots, but that was he was usually their their primary guy at, at nickel. Um, so with losing Snead, it make it made sense to kind of move him outside to be that number one corner, and then they moved uh, Shabani Connor from safety to nickel, like full time now. Um, and so they kind of just have a it's been a competition between three guys there: Jalen Watson, Joshua Williams, and Nazi Johnson. I know they really like uh, Nazi Johnson. Um, it's kind of just a question of it, it's really just a 50 50. I know like we just had our uh, I don't know what his name was, but our, our chief's insider like like, like Greg has uh, he just asked right. him yesterday and um, he was saying that it's it's just a 50 50 between Nazi Johnson and Jalen Watson. They'll probably both play like equal. So um, I, I just list I changed it yesterday actually because they listed it as Watson as the starter, but I've had Johnson as the starter there as well. So it's just, we'll see tonight what ends up happening, but that's going to be the big spot. I mean, I think it helps that they're against the Ravens who don't have like two elite receivers or anything, but it's still like, you know, you have to contend with Derrick Henry and then Mark Andrews and Zay Flowers. So they they have plenty of, plenty of uh, weapons there to to contend with. That's interesting. All right. Well, let, let's let's wrap this up by talking about the game in tomorrow night, uh, because no, no one down there is really going to be allowed to talk about the game because they don't have X down there. <laughs> and it's, uh, you know, we, we won't question the decision of putting a game in Brazil. We'll let other smarter people do that. Let's stick to to the football. Right. All stake, That's no right. sizzle. It's a mantra uh, of our lads. Uh, what are you looking for as a depth chart manager here um, on either team? And Tucker's back. <laughs> <laughs> I just said leave soon. Just like, I'm out of here. That, that'll um, be yeah. I was I was about to start talking to myself. I, I didn't know what to do there. So, uh, uh, but yeah, let, let's talk about um, if you can go back to share screen. But why why you're doing that? What are you looking for tomorrow night in that Eagles Packers game? Uh, two two of the NFC favorites, right? I think the NFC is really going to be down to four teams. Uh, these two guys and Niners and, and Lions, but. What are you looking for um, as the depth chart manager in this game? Yeah, so for the Packers, the the big stuff, I mean, they have a lot of the same, most of their starters are the same um, guys from last year. It's still a very young team, though, so it's not like they're all a very proven thing. Um, it's It'll be interesting to see how well they carry over, kind of how they were doing at the end of last season, okay. um, especially with Jordan Love. But I'm, I'm looking at the uh, the running back room with them moving on from, from Aaron Jones. Can Josh Jacobs just fill in there? Uh, how much – I think Emmanuel Wilson will probably play more more than people expect he will. Um, and as well as their safety room is like the big big one that they kind of overhauled. They drafted, yeah. got, they drafted Bullard in the second, Evan Williams in the fourth, who they both – they love both of those guys so far. And then Tano Ladapo – in the fifth round, he hasn't really played too much because of injury, but um, he he's, he can shore up some depth there as well. And then the big free agent acquisition they made during the offseason was uh, Xavier McKinney from, from the Giants, who you, yep. you, you know well, I'm sure. Yep. Yeah, that, that's going to be how quickly can these guys adapt to playing with each other? Because, right, this, 
My son wants to give some input. He's excited to hear about McKinney, one of his favorite players. Go, 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 go. He's really excited about tonight's game. But <laughs> the spine of the defense is in charge with a lot of the communication. And if these guys are all new and they don't have that much chemistry and there's multiple bodies, you said four of the five safeties you've added to this group uh, through the depth chart. Brock, he'll just go. He'll follow you. He'll follow you. Um, you know, that that's going to be a really interesting test to take on with, a, with an offense that is equally run and pass. And so they can attack you from all angles. So that's going to be a fun thing to watch. Um, what about the, the on the Eagles side of the ball, right? They trade for Jahan Dotson. And does he automatically go to the slot? He's the automatically the number three guy, right? You don't see, and we've heard some Johnny Wilson hype, a six rounder from Florida State that's kind of half tight end, half wide receiver. Darren Waller type is who I compared him to last mm -hmm. year uh, in terms of the skill set. Is, is Dotson, even though he wasn't there for all of the uh, offseason, most of the preseason, do you think he could be a factor in this one? Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he wasn't, like, you know, he wasn't uh, playing as many snaps as Devontae Smith and A.J. Brown were. But I, I will say that I think I think Kobe will probably play a good amount and, and Johnny Wilson will have, have his snaps as well. But they okay. definitely – them trading for Dotson was not just, you know – this was something they've been – planning on i think doing for a while um they just kind of had to find the right player right team to to make the move with and so he kind of fits in perfectly to be the number three guy he's that, that slot spot has been completely just shuffled around every week i feel like um for, by me because just they've been trying different guys there uh, all off season like paris campbell and he ended up not making the team right um which i wasn't super surprised by but but on the other hand he was like kind of the main guy playing first team snaps yeah. for them all off season. So it's yeah. kind of, it's kind of bizarre when it, when it happens, because it's like, why didn't you guys move on earlier? So it's yeah. I mean, Harry Roseman has proven general manager, Harry Roseman has proven to win trades left and right yeah. uh, uh, with via the draft and, and free agency and veteran players. So, you know, last thing to wrap this up on the defensive side of the ball, um, Devin white is in red. Is he confirmed out for tomorrow night? Yeah, he, he didn't travel to Brazil with the team. So oh, Okay, so he's definitely out. So who yeah. do you think gets that look? Do you think it's the next guy you have, N'Kobe Dean? Do you think there's any shot that we see rookie Jeremiah Trotter wearing his father's number uh, back in with the Eagles in the middle? Or do you think it's no doubt N'Kobe Dean? I think Dean will start, but I'd like to see Trotter play. Like, I mean, Same. he he has – there's a reason he's in the second string above, like, Burks and Ben Simmering, which is – it's not just special teams. It's like he, he is a – going to be a solid guy for them um there was stuff coming out after Devin white was hurt and he didn't travel that they might he might have been like a, a trade candidate uh at roster cut down it's been a pretty big competition there like zach bond has been uh kind of the top guy but then behind him it's been dean versus white and then trotter they're mixing in so with white out i think that it'll be a little bit of a rotation between those three just depending on how much how, how well trotter uh kind of uh adjust to the to the professional level right yeah i mean no matter what this defense is going to be built on on what happens up front between milton williams jordan davis jalen carter bryce Suff, even zach bond who who these guys signed off in new orleans who has been a disappointment to this point but mm -hmm. you know this team is just so deep uh, along the defensive front you could see throughout that chart the resources that they put up there uh but let's wrap it up with the the two rookie corners that they have you have quinion mitchell who was primarily an outside corner in college. They are putting him in at nickel with Cooper DeGene's probably going to get some looks there as well. Um, was that a, a skill set thing? Do you think, was that a rookie thing? Or do you think that, you know, these depth charts, you already had the outside corners. So the rookies had to kind of right, earn their right of passage by, you know, playing this lot. Where, where did you think that came from? Yeah, I think it's. I think that it was partially his skill set that he he kind of did translate well to playing slot. He he played the slot a lot, like during during the off season. It wasn't like something they just changed recently or anything. Um, I think it's partially because uh, Isaiah Rogers and Keely Ringo they both kind of been rotating at that that other starting spot across from Slay. Um, they like both of those guys a lot uh, on the outside, and so. I think that their plan right now is kind of just, they might, they're definitely going to shuffle them around. Um, but it, it's the, when the team released their depth chart, it, it matched the same, like Mitchell first string, nickel, Dijin second. Dijin is a little bit behind because he's been hurt all right. off season. Um, right. But so I don't know how much he'll play in the first game, but uh, I, I'm 
sure Quinion Mitchell will play a, a lot here. I'm, I'm interested to see how well uh, he holds up and also Isaiah Rogers and Keely Ringo, if, if they're able to kind of, you know, lock down their side of the field. I mean, they'll be tested because Green Bay is they, – they 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 take pride in not having a number one receiver. They, they don't have number one, number two, number three. It's they, they really do spread the ball out based on matchups and spacing and and where the defense is shifting towards. So that's going to be – it's going to be a big test for this secondary that is going to be relying on a couple of new guys and, and a couple of young guys uh, without, without a starting middle linebacker at the spine of the defense. All right. Well, is there anything else that you think as the our lads depth chart manager that we need to be aware of as we approach week one of the NFL season? I mean, I'm just excited to see just all the new players and, and you know, it, new, new teams, new coaches. It's just, uh, it's always interesting to see like those guys who just all of a sudden start breaking out like Cordero Patterson with the Falcons. just like, you right. know, he's 31 and it's just Random. like, oh, he's actually, he's their top running back weapon guy now. Just yep. out of nowhere. No one thought that was going to happen. So yep. things like that, who will be this year's Puka Nakua, you know, there's going to be crazy stuff like that. Um, yeah. Right you, you got to love it because you just stare at these names nonstop, <laughs> always inputting, outputting and putting in the data around them, but to actually see them on the field and, see it live in action it probably brings a different level of uh of just fulfillment because what you do it's it's not easy work it, it's a lot of busy work and i think a lot of people couldn't do it you know even if you love football it's, just, it's a lot of work and um you do an awesome job better than everyone at I appreciate keeping it. all of us updated on what's going on in the league and i think you do you, you deserve to to enjoy the games here yeah i'm just excited to finally have stuff other than preseason so cool. <laughs> And this yeah, I don't know if you hear my son right now. He's screaming in the background, so he <laughs> sounds pretty excited too. So with that, we'll wrap it up, guys. We'll see you again next week. Um, I promise we won't go 50 minutes every episode, but uh, we just wanted to put a little extra information out there because there's always a lot to talk about uh, in between preseason and regular season. Uh, but we will try to shore it up as we go. We'll try to keep these to about a half hour. You'll expect them every week. Um, enjoy week one. Make us yourself a promise. You're not going to overreact to a win, to a loss, to a good performance, bad performance. It's usually a bad look, especially if you go public with your opinions on that kind of stuff. <laughs> uh, but I would say one thing you can take away from week one is is depth chart based, and we'll be we'll, we got your back there. We'll be on top of it uh, with what guys come in on certain pass rush packages. Who who truly is second string defensive tackle, DN, offensive line, wide receivers. We'll stay on top of it for you guys. You can make some educated decisions, whether it's your betting, um, your your cooler talk at work, or uh, your fantasy leagues. Uh, we got your back on that. So come back every week, and we'll, we'll hook you guys up. Thanks, Tucker. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. All right. Enjoy week one, my man.